Okay, thank you very much for speaking to us this evening. So can we, can I please ask you to introduce yourself and give us a little bit of background about what, um, who you are and what you do. Okay, my name is Jim Thompson. I'm from the United States. I work with the NASA Spaceward Bound Program. This is my sixth Spaceward Bound project in uh, four countries and three continents. My expertise is in remote sensing, utilizing the infrared wavelengths for uh, finding caves and hot springs, karst areas, limestone, etc. Now, how did you get um, involved in this? Where did you start and how did you get where you are now? I was doing some training on utilizing of infrared and it reminded me of a friend of mine many years ago, back in the 1960s, who used to find caves on a very cold day with a following barometric pressure and the caves would breathe, kind of like a manhole cover does on a cold day. And I was wondering if an infrared camera could be used to pick up that visible moisture that comes out of the air, or out of the ground, into the air, by, say, a low-flying aircraft utilizing the infrared wavelengths. I started doing research on this, and I contacted the FLIR, the forward-looking infrared, the largest manufacturer of infrared technology in the world, as well as the president of the National Speleological Society of the United States, Cave Exploring Center, and said, who's working on this? And somebody had heard of somebody who worked on it back in the 70s, but it didn't work, etc. And in those days, infrared was considered portable because you could put a 200 kilowatt uh, generator on the back of a truck with a liquid nitrogen tank, and therefore it was portable because it could be put on a Defense Department truck. Nowadays, they're this size right here. Very, very portable. I started researching it and found out that there wasn't anybody really looking at it for a scientific application. They were using it for military applications, building applications, electricity, electronics, finding hot spots, manufacturing hot spots, etc. But they weren't looking necessarily at the earth. So I started doing that. I wrote a paper. I was internationally published. And it turned out NASA had a feasibility study to find out if this would happen. They utilized my research to end a three-year grant, two years early, which was interesting for the people who had the grant, but uh, that was uh, phase one. I was invited to uh, Spaceward Bound in the Atacama Desert of Chile for phase two, and that was uh, five Spaceward Bounds ago. So it's just um, the technology is being used to compare with satellite photos on Mars. It's quite exciting. Were you always interested in science? Were you? How did you get into science in the first place? Was this something that you um, were interested in early or later? I, I came basically from a, uh, a business background where we would take a tremendous amount of new discoveries out of the lab and take it into the commercial sector and then utilize it to handle situations. My particular expertise was in handling large-scale catastrophes for major international corporations. And we would take things that was in theory in different chemical labs, electronics, et cetera, and then take it out into the building industry after hurricanes wiped out like Hurricane Katrina or something like that in the United States and uh, use it to, say, college campuses or large manufacturing. So we just started thinking this could be applied. I've been a cave explorer for 40 years, and this could be used to find caves. Dr. Penny Boston, my good friend, one time, approached me and said, Jim, you've got to stop thinking terrestrial. Think extraterrestrial. You've got to start thinking about finding caves on Mars. I'm like, right. <laughs> and uh, that's what the research is being used for right now, is finding caves on Mars. Because in caves, that's where water could be. You follow the water, you follow life. That's where life could be. We could also follow water and make hydrogen fuel to get home on. We could follow water and we could filter it and make our astronauts comfortable, livable, etc. We could also find caves or lava tubes and build a human habitat by just putting in some airlocks and not have to build in that horrible, I shouldn't say horrible, but a very extreme Martian atmosphere. So what do you like most about your job, what you do? I work with very bright people. I go to extreme environments and we push the envelope of known into the unknown 
And when we're done, hopefully it s s disseminates, it, it puts out a fever that gets other people excited. That not everything is known. Not everything is taught in school. Not everything is known by the professors. There are things that are unknown. And utilizing science, we can find those things out and do things like go to Mars. The people who will walk on the surface of Mars are in school today. Today, they're in school. If they take science, if they take math, if they get excited in physical sciences, maybe they're the ones who will do it. So if you're investigating caves on Mars, what are you doing in Australia? There are similar aspects of places on Earth to places in the universe. It's kind of funny because it doesn't mean that the planets that are up there are necessarily totally different chemicals or rocks or whatever. It might be a different combination, but it might be the same chemicals and elements that we have on this planet. So if we study what an image looks like here, for example, what does a cave look like here? What does a hot pool look like here, etc.? And we take this and we research it and we do all sorts of measurements and types and measurements and have all sorts of fun out there. And then we give it to the NASA scientists and they compare these with actual satellite images of Mars. Rover images of Mars. A rover might be looking at something that the scientists don't know what it means. We do research here and they say, wait, this is what it looked like in the Atacama Desert of Chile. This is what it looked like in Mexico. This is what it looked like in the Mojave Desert. This is what it looked like in the Outback. How exciting. Maybe we need to test to see if that is, for example, a cave or a chemical. Fantastic. So how can Australian students get involved in something like this? I'm sorry, didn't How can we get Australian students involved in, in something like this? I think what they need to do is get together with their teachers and say, what fun can we have on field trips? What fun can we have in math? Math isn't all just figures and cosines and things like that. There's some fun things to do. For example, by utilizing a special infrared camera like this, there's a lot of math that goes into the formulas here. You don't necessarily have to have it to operate it, but it sure makes it a lot easier when you're trying to figure out, I am 3,000 feet in the air, and I am one kilometer away from the surface, because airplanes are still going by feet, even in Australia. And therefore, how many meters am I from this to that to be able to tell the computer here inside this this machine to tell what it's looking at how much radiation it's getting etc it's 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 quite exciting Does it? now you mentioned that you're sort of working in some you've worked in some extreme environments what sort of environments have you worked in as a scientist mainly deserts deserts and caves inside of caves but been in some very nasty fun 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 places the Atacama Desert is so dry, it's the driest place on the planet Earth. The Spanish started keeping records in 15 and 36, and there's parts of the Atacama that has not ever had recorded rain. It is completely dry. In fact, Dr. Chris McKay once wrote a paper called Too Dry for Life. It is so dry that life, there are no flies, there are no bugs, there is nothing. Now, there might be microscopic things underneath some quartz of granite, we're finding out now, but it is so dry there is nothing. So the coldest, wettest day on Earth might be the warmest, driest day on Mars. So if we go to these extreme environments, way out, like out here in the outback, etc., and we walk the hills and we feel the wind in our face and all, we can almost imagine what would happen if that was 98% of carbon dioxide at uh, 6 millibars pressure, 1,000 millibars less pressure than what we're dealing with here. That what we see on the ground might be exactly the same life structures that are up there. And to think that the work we are doing here today is applied to a planet that we get to watch go across the sky. And someday, people that we might work with or use our technology will use it up there to sustain human life. That's exciting. 
What happens if this planet has a meteorite coming at it? It might be kind of nice to have some people somewhere else. Thank you very much.